I have two lectures. They, the first one's a lot, they'll, they'll just merge one seamlessly into the other. We'll stop at 10.30 and 9, 10.30 and then we'll go on, we'll probably make the transition in the second lecture between my first set of slides and the second set of slides. Okay, and these slides, particularly in the first part, are um, largely due to slides produced by former student Brian O'Gorman. Yes. Okay, so here's the outline of the first part, which is first of all, um, to summarize for those of you that are not very familiar, uh, the form of the chemical Hamiltonian for electronic structure. Then I'll talk about a little bit about classical approaches, and finally then, after we make the transition from fermionic operators to spin operators, uh, the quantum approaches. So the model for quantum chemistry is that we have um, our nuclei, which are regarded as point charges, surrounded by a sea or a cloud of electrons, and the nuclei are generally treated in we're just looking at the structure of electronic states, energies and their wave functions and their properties. We typically treat the nuclei as classical and in particular stationary. We use the von Oppenheimer approximation. Um, and the electrons are treated quantumly. And so we typically solve then for given values of the, um, of the uh, nuclear positions, so shown here for a canonical example of a diatomic molecule. So we've got two nuclei and they're separated by distance r. And then at each point r, we solve for the electronic energies um, in the uh, due to the, all of the columbic interactions between the electrons and the nuclei. So that gives us a nuclear um, energy surface, E of R, um, that can be then used as a potential surface for doing calculations in which the nuclei now move. So molecules are defined to be formed at the local minima of such uh, electronic energy uh, potential surfaces. So here's a, um, a simple statement of the electronic structure problem. So we have then the, um, the sum of the electronic and nuclear energies. And in the first instance, we'll treat these. This is in the born oppenheimer approximation. They're distinct. Um, and so we wish to solve for the electronic states, psi, for given nuclear positions R. So that means that we wish to minimize over all possible wave functions the expectation value of the Hamiltonian operator um, in each state psi. And the Hamiltonian operator is written in this second quantized form uh, as a sum of one body terms here and two body terms here. And I'll motivate this form a little bit in the next slide, but you've already had lectures from Anna Krilov on classical quantum chemistry. This is all classical at this point. So here's an example, the state of one electron. So we have one electron and it has a wave function in real space, psi of r, uh, which can be complex. So that's a mapping from a real variable position, r to complex um, amplitude of the wave function. And the wave functions are normalized over all space. And we typically, well, if you want to do computations, you have to take a finite basis. So we typically take some basis, uh, one electron basis functions, and we call these spatial orbitals. And we would expand our unknown wave function in terms of this. So here's an expansion over a finite truncation of one electron states. And we could represent that as an n-level qubit, basically take the coefficients and take a, um, a vector, so this is now going towards quantum state notation. We can take a vector, label it by p, which is a number between 1 and n. It can be also put into binary representation and with coefficients a, p. So we can represent a standard one electron wave function as an n-level qubit. And in general, there is some basis set error. And this is one of the things which sort of puts an ultimate restriction or constraint on computational quantum chemistry. So we we're not going to worry about this too much, but there is, you have to make sure that your basis is, is, is good. 
So here's a state now of two electrons, which gets a bit more interesting, because now we have to um, think about the uh, fundamental symmetry, spin symmetry of electrons, which are fermions. So if we have our finite basis here, and two electrons are in this finite basis, then we can always write the wave function as a sum over product states uh, with coefficients here. And so this sum may be entangled or may not, and you probably know how to determine whether it is to some extent. You can take the Schmidt rank of this and see whether it's um, finite beyond one. So if we have two n-level qubits, then, so we take the same basis, we, we write it in this form. Then we have to impose this anti-symmetry for fermions. So that means if we swap the indices of particles one and two, of the electrons one and two, that the wave function goes to um, the negative of it. Otherwise, so it gains a phase of, of pi, or e to the i pi is minus one, um, but otherwise it's unchanged. So that, then we take a further step, which is to take the states of particles in terms of these um, basis functions, which we would write like this to make something which is anti-symmetric. We'll say that now we're going to just consider this uh, we're going to just consider for each of these basis functions, what is the occupation of that? Is it zero or is it one? Or in principle, it could be two if we add the spin degree of freedom, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. So that's the, the second representation that we go towards, which is a, actually formally the second quantized representation. We, we consider just the occupation of the states which are defined in some particular um, chosen basis. So for example, if we have two electrons and four orbitals, then this, the states of these particles, anti-symmetrized, would translate to occupations of all of the states. And here's an example. So we could have, if we have four orbitals, we could have the two particles in orbitals one and two. We have to anti-symmetrize that. And we would write that, if our indexing is orbital 1, 2, 3, and 4, we would write that as an occupation vector 1, 1, 0, 0. Or if the particles are in states 1 and 3, anti-symmetrized, we write that in the occupation representation as 1, 0, 1, 0. 1 and 4 state is represented as 1, 0, 0, 1, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if I generalize this now to n electrons, so we have n, then little n is the number of electrons, and they are all able to occupy these capital N levels, states. So we write our total n electron, little n electron wave function as a sum over tensor products of single particle states. And then now for all of these n electrons, which are identical, we have to have this anti-symmetrization uh, constraint. So if we swap any two indices, the total wave function has to change sign. And so then we can write this in terms of, in terms of these states as, as this somewhat formidable looking object in this notation. But this basically is the, a determinant, which is very familiar to those of you do, who, who do quantum chemistry, which has uh, consists of a sum of terms which differing by permutations over the little n electrons. And each, each permutation, pi, has associated with a sign. And so they're pairwise permutations, and each individual pairwise permutation gives you a negative sign, but you then have to multiply all the signs together, so you get an overall sign for each permutation. And this is then in this uh, original representation, but we can then also translate this to the occupation number representation where we have just a bit string describing the occupations of each of the orbitals. And there then, then there is an associated sign. The associated sign comes out in the front with the coefficient. Okay, so now we, from now on we're going to work in this occupation basis because it's much simpler than explicitly writing out all these permutations. So in the occupation basis, we have, we have our 
our vector n. So the components are 0 and 1. And we have a constraint that the sum over all of the um, little n's for each orbital p is equal to little n, the total number of electrons. And then the operators that act on these states are now these operators that create or annihilate, or destroy or create electrons. And, that, and those are used to move the electrons around from one orbital to another. And so if you look at the annihilation operator, AP, so that will act on the orbital P in between P minus 1 and P plus 1. When there's a 1, it will act to bring that 1 down to a 0. But because this AP has to move through this state, through all of these other um, terms here, before it gets to N sub P, it gains this phase factor, which is due to the commutation relations. Uh, they don't have uh, the A... Let's see. Yes, it's due to this commutation relation here. So each of the, each of, if there's a one here, that means that essentially there was an A dagger P, a creation operator acting on the vacuum for that particular orbital. So when you move it by past there, you have to use this commutation relation here, and you will, if you do the algebra, this was actually, uh, this would be a homework question. I uh, haven't had time to put homework questions together, but I could post some afterwards. It's a good exercise to go through and to verify for yourselves where this phase comes from. And then similarly, if, uh, if the, however, AP acts on this state, number of representation, and there's a zero in orbital P, in other words, there isn't an electron there, then this will mean that this creation operator will act on basically the vacuum state for that mode. And so that gives you zero. It destroys the state. So, and you can do the same with the creation operators. So creation operator A dagger P will act on the mode P, or the orbital P, to create a state if there was none there. So we go from zero to one. And it will also have this phase factor associated with it because it has to climb over all these other um, modes before it gets to this one. And A dagger P will act on one. When, if, there, if there's already an electron in there, we know from the spin statistics theorem, that's derived from the anti-symmetry and the fundamental principle of um, Pauli, that that will then destroy the state because we cannot have two electrons in the same, with all the same quantum numbers. So, and again, I'm kind of ignoring, or let's say the spin is there, it's implicit, but we're not, we don't, don't have to distinguish between the spin and the space at this point. Okay, and then the other important operator, that's the nice and easy one, is the number operator, which is A dagger A. And so this will act on a state, and whatever the number N sub P is, A dagger P, A, P will pull out that number N, P in front. So that's the eigenvalue um, for that particular operator in the front. And so you can use these expressions to show that um, part of the commutation relations, so in other words, A dagger A plus, oh, for, and plus A, A dagger for a particular mode, P is 1. And you can also... Um, so the anti-symmetry requires that the, if you take two operators, AP and AQ, and you invert them, then you'd get the negative sign, and then that will put that all together, and you've got this algebra where AP and AQ, different states, will um, anti-commute, and then if they're in the same state, we'll have the one, so you put that together uh, with, with so, so if you have this, if you have AP and A dagger Q, that will also anti-commute if they're different, but if, it's, if they're not different, then we get this one factor. And so we can very, uh, very conveniently write the entire state then in terms of our vacuum state, which is when there's zero part electrons in any, uh, any of these orbitals. And then we have creation operators to the, raised to the power n, where n will be 0 or 1 because of the anti-symmetry property. And, and notice if n is 0, these terms are 1, so you'll just have a smaller number of... So you really only have the, the raising operators corresponding to the orbitals that are occupied. And so that will give us an occupation vector. 
So this is a standard second quantized notation that's used in quantum chemistry and also very widely used in physics. For, uh, Can I ask a question about this? Yes. Um, so I think later you're going to tell us how to map this on the spin. Yes. So this kind of is almost, these things it's, I might call them sigma plus, sigma minus instead of a dagger. But sigma plus and sigma minus have very different commutation relations. Yeah. That's, that's a, oh, it's, it, no. No, no, these are fermionic commutation relations. We need to add a phase. We need to go to spin commutation relations. Spin commutation relations, if we have spins on different sites, they commute with each other always. Oh, you mean for later, for the later step? Yes. Yeah, I'm just saying for this step, like why I'm kind of interested in the, why people would call these A and A daggers, because I would oh, A and kind of closer to what I would call spin operators. No, the notation A and A dagger probably derives from actually the harmonic oscillator. Yeah, I see. yeah, they're raising and lowering operators. These are raising and lowering operators. In, in the spin language, these would be sigma plus and sigma minus. Right, yeah. right, right. This is, also I'm trying to use the language of quantum chemistry. So. And no, it, was, but it was kind of like a society question of why did people choose <laughs> People typically use A and A dagger for fermions and B and B dagger for bosons. But then there's lots of people who use A and A dagger for bosons too. So <laughs> it's a choice. Okay, so now we have our, so those are the states in second quantized representation. And here's now the Hamiltonian. It's as far as you know, physics as a whole goes, this is a very simple Hamiltonian non-relativistic, it has uh, just Coulombic interactions. So we have the uh, electron-nuclear interactions, the electron-electron interactions, and then we have, if we're doing the electronic structure, we have just the kinetic energy of the electrons, first term here. And so this is an instance of an electronic structure problem where we have a certain number of nuclei, a certain number of uh, charges, parameterizing these uh, potential terms here, and a certain number of lit electrons, little n, which is less than or equal to the number of orbitals. And it's, I think, fairly standard nota notation in quantum chemistry to use little n for the number of electrons and capital N for the number of um, orbitals or spin orbitals. It's a little bit confusing when you first start reading the literature, but you'll get used to it. Okay, so the first thing we have to then do is we, we also have a choice of one electron orbitals. And once we make a choice of one electron orbitals, then we can evaluate integrals between these basis states, these orbitals, and um, we can make matrix elements of integrals of these operators between these one electron orbitals. So those quantities are then are these little h's indexed by either two for a one-body operator or four indices for a two-body operator are the parameters in our Hamiltonian. And so now we write the, we arrive at the Hamiltonian in the occupation basis. Remember this was the occupation basis. We had these vectors, occupation numbers n, and each one has its uh, coefficient, psi n. Altogether, that gives us the overall wave function, and so now, then our Hamiltonian is of this form. Okay, so that's the original Hamiltonian I wrote down on the first slide. Okay. So at this point, we have something where the states here are anti-symmetrized by construction. The signs are kind of hit, hidden, they're implicitly in the construction of n and they will show up whenever we evaluate these, um, uh, well, they will show up whenever you start operating with this Hamiltonian because they, they reflect the commutation relations of the A daggers and the A's. So once we start working with this H, we'll see the effects of the anti-symmetry. In general, we generally have more uh, orbitals than we have number of electrons. We have to um, have at least uh, twice the number of orbitals so when we add the spin. But normally we have a lot more to give flexibility in terms of making variational calculations. And these coefficients come from the integrals that I showed you uh, before, which are the 
um, physical wave functions. Okay, so that's the, the, the basis. Um, the states and the Hamiltonians, and the second quantization, that's all completely classical. Now a little bit more on classical. I think you've had lectures from Anna Krilov on this, but just to put in this language, to summarize it, um, the starting point for going to quantum. So the, the bottom line, the, the, the simplest approximation is to make a uh, to find the electronic states of a system is to make a so-called a mean field approximation. So it's referred to as Hartree-Fock. Um, Hartree-Fock will produce the best set of n1 electron orbitals where best means in a mean field sense. In particular, you're taking each electron and you're considering all the other electrons, that, that one electron to be moving in an average field produced by all the other electrons in addition to the nuclei. So, for instance, if you have one electron and you consider only the, the end lowest energy states, then there would be no correlations there. You would just be putting one electron in and then each electron in um, a different energy state. So, hartree fock goes beyond this a little bit, bit by considering the average effect of the other electrons. So, how is that described in this representation? So it's basically a change of basis. So that's a unitary operator, U, which is a complex capital N by capital N operator, where N is the number of uh, spin orbitals. Now I'm going to use the term spin orbitals in general uh, from now on. So and in the particle representation, we'd say that, well, our state Xi, so it's that, remember that's a qubit state. So it's a number which represents um, a particular orbital, spatial orbital, will be transformed according to the unitary transformation U. So our basis Xi will become a, set, a basis X tilde I. And then if I take an n particle state here, which is a, the tensor product of X1 to Xn, that will be transformed to the tensor product of X tilde ones, which is basically a tensor product of each single particle basis transformed by the one particle um, change of basis. Okay, so it's just this U is just a tensor product of single particle U's. And that's because, that's not general, it's because it's mean field, because we're doing this in a mean field representation. So then in the occupation representation, we write the A's, the A operators as A tilde operators, and they're obtained from the, 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 the original A operators by the same unitary transformation, mu. And we can then say that our state, which was originally the vacuum state with these creation operators raised to some power, to the power of the occupation of the orbitals, this transforms now in, in a perfectly well-defined way to a new occupation basis, n tilde. Yes? Can you repeat again why this change of basis is only applicable for mean field states? Is, or why is the change of basis only applicable when you deal with mean field solutions? Because in general, if I have an n particle wave function and I make a change of, I make some unitary on it, that unitary will not necessarily decompose into a product of single qubit unitaries. But because I'm doing mean field, I'm basically taking, mean, in the mean field representation, each particle is represented in a one part. There are no, each particle is represented by a one particle wave function coexisting with the others in a tensor product. And then there are no explicit correlations in the wave function between the two, between the n particles, between the individual one particle states. So you effectively do a product of one particle transformations. Okay. Okay, so, all right, so, so we have now our Hartree Fock creation operators here. And, okay, so written again up here. And so the Hartree Fock state is the best uh, state of this form. Remember, these states are essentially determinantal types of wave functions. Um, sort of carefully disguised, so you can't really recognize it in the number occupation vector. 
that the Hartree Fox state is the best one of these, which is the state that minimizes um, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian written in the second quantized form with the A's and A daggers. And this is the expectation value between the state N tilde, N tilde here, or actually, yeah, with N tilde over here on the right. And this is adjoint of N tilde on the left. Okay, and we minimize this with respect over all possible unitaries. In other words, all possible mean field transformations. So then we have a new basis, which we call the Hartree-Fock basis, uh, which is the best possible single determinant. And this will look like a string of zeros and ones in this occupation number representation. So it looks very innocuous, but a, it sits on a lot of structure and, form, and uh, formal construction, which is implicit, it brings with it, and which you see when you start to operate with operators on this state. Okay. And typically in this, uh, once we're in this um, best minimal energy basis, we typically then reorder the orbital so that we have all of the ones with occupation on the left and all of the ones which are empty with zeros on the right. Yes? I have a question, like why is H, that is basically kind of an expectation value, right? This is, yeah, it's exactly, there's an expectation value between uh, of, of H in the state N tilde. So on the right, you see this is N tilde because it's a vacuum state. And then we've operated with A1 dagger all the way up to AN dagger. So these are all the occupied um, orbitals. Okay, so that's, that's N tilde. And on the left, that's just the adjoint of N tilde. Okay. So, but all of that is a quantity, right? And it's color. So why that is equal to a cat that is HF or it's just a notation? No, this is sandwiched. This, this is a bra, this is a cat, yeah. and in the middle is H. Yeah, so that will give you a number, right? Is what he's asking. Oh, so... Uh, I think that Hartree-Fock cat yeah, is yeah, the, yeah. the, the zero Hartree that minimizes. Cat. Hartree-Fock cat is the cat that minimizes this. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sorry, this is... Yeah. Okay. I inherited the... Yeah. Where's Brian? I inherited the PDF, but not the, <laughs> not, not the text. So, uh, yes, that is... There are a few typos in this. File. Yeah, so that's. Yeah, it's, it's a cat is the state that. Is, minimize. Yes, minimize that. Yes. Thank you. If we discover, we discover more, then let me know. Call them out. All right, so that's your best Hartree Fock. And this is normally the starting place for any electronic structure calculation, whether it's classical or quantum. Okay, so. So then it, but in Hartree Fock, this is mean field, and this really isn't good enough to describe most molecular systems. Because for each electron, you're just averaging out, smearing out the effect of all the other electrons. And even though the relative amount of, of the energy that you're neglecting is relatively small compared to the total energy of a molecule, it might be typically it's less than 5% of the total energy. Small differences in that 5% are responsible for large differences in chemistry. So quantum chemistry is all about getting this last 5% of the energy that's referred to as a correlation energy, that's the energy that's not described by a Hartree-Fock solution. So that's what it's all about. So what does one do to go beyond this Hartree-Fock solution? Well, one basically, in a sense, searches around a Hartree-Fock state and one does that by taking Hartree-Fock solutions like this and then saying, well, let's, let's consider some, we know we have a set of orbitals and some of them are occupied, some of them are unoccupied. Let's consider what happens, what kind of determinants do we produce if we take an electron out of a filled orbital and put it in an unfilled orbital. So... This one, yeah, I'm not sure this is, this should be, yeah, this is APAQ. Right, this takes, an, this operator here will take an electron from an occupied orbital P, AP, it'll, it'll destroy that, an electron in P, and it will create an electron in Q. So this orbital, this operator here will create a single um, excitation in Q, having removed 
uh, an excitation from P. Okay, so that's known as a single excitation. So we can make, if we're given Hartree Fox state with little n electrons, we can make quite a few of these. And then we can go beyond that and we can say, well, there might be more uh, excitations that are relevant to our true state, and, uh, namely double excitations. And here we're taking two electrons out of occupied states, P and Q, and we're moving them into unoccupied states, R and S. And one can do the same with higher and higher orders. Okay. And each of these excitations represents the injection of some kind of correlation between the electrons beyond this mean field. It means we're taking, so if you imagine what this single excitation is doing, it's taking an electron out of a particular orbital on a molecule and moving it to another specific orbital. That corresponds to a, a correlation that's beyond the mean field sense because we're isolating one electron in one orbital and sending it to another one, which could be an orbital of different energy, could be an orbital of different spatial extent. So that's the real spatial or energetic correlation we're adding. Okay, so all of these terms beyond hartree fock which are often described by single, double, and triple types of excitations out of hartree fock states, are generating correlations between electrons. And that's what we need to get more accurate energies. Okay, so one way that people often do this classically is, uh, well, we want to create a whole set. So this, this tells us that in order to add correlations, we have to include more than this one basic hartree fock determinant. We have to add more of them, which have electrons correlated in different ways. And we want to then, so then we will say, build a set of such determinants, and we would like to find the minimum energy. if We expanded our wave function over all of those determinants. So that's the idea behind adaptive sampling, where one has um, a small set of determinants first, one expands this, for instance, by adding excitations, more excitations to get a larger set of determinants, then you would um, diagonalize either exactly or approximately, and you then truncate back again to a small set of determinants, and again start expanding. And as you're doing this truncation and expansion, you are constantly refining your best guess by constantly exploring further and further out to more sophisticated correlations, and then pulling back in only those terms that are relevant to the energy, You're just constantly refining the energy. So that's the method that's quite popular these days, of select, selective um, or adaptive uh, configuration interaction. Okay, so this is, now we're going to make the transition to how do we represent these kind of systems and these kind of calculations which, where we want to obtain this energy that's beyond the hartree fock beyond the mean field energy. How do we represent these on a quantum computer? Yes. So in the hartree fock sense, we have this occupation basis and it's yes. just like a product state. Yes. It's like a single product state. Uh, it's not really. It looks like one, but it has this, it's constructed on this. A basis, this other yeah. basis, right? Yeah. But in like the hartree fock basis, yes. it's a product state? Because that's what it looks like, and it looks like you're going to... No, the hartree fock add... basis itself is a, is a determinant. Right. The hartree fock state is a determinant. Well, I guess like when I, when you, if you go into the hartree fock wave function, um, right, I mean... Oh, here? Yeah. Yeah, so it looks like this. Yes. Yes. But there's an implicit, this represents one determinant. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't see that until you operate on it with operators and so on. Okay. It looks like a product state, right. but it's not really. Okay. Yeah. Yes? If we're doing this adaptive truncation and you're... Oh, we're, thinking... we're not going to. Okay. The classical people do. Okay. But we're not going to do that. Okay. This is still classical at this point. Okay. That was a classical interlude. But I guess my, my like classical question yes. is that if you're constantly doing this, do you update the like the Hartree Fock orbitals or like the natural orbitals? And if so, like do people have strong guarantees on like that being stable as you're doing this truncation of the uh, You can do it without updating the Hartree Fock, I think. Because you, can, you have a particular set of determinants and a particular reference. 
So when if you're creating excitations out of a particular reference, then but if you're adding more determinants, then uh, you're saying that you would then modify each basis. You can do that. You can do that. Yes, you can do that. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to switch to quantum. So our goal is, in the first instance, to prepare the ground state. In practice, you can also do excited states, but I'm just going to talk about the ground state. So the first thing we need to do is we need to move from this fermionic representation that I, that I basically developed and talked about and tied to these operators A and A dagger, which obey fermionic quantum uh, commutation rules. We need to move from that to a qubit state representation. And qubit state representation, well, it looks very similar if I write it like this, right? This is a fermionic state, it's a number occupation. Uh, we have this vector of zeros and ones. And if we have a qubit, well, our basis in the computational basis of the qubit is also zero and one. And so we would write a, a ket for, an N, for a little n. Uh, sorry, capital N, because this is the number of orbitals, we would write a ket as Q1 to Q capital N. So it looks very, very similar, where the Qs are also zeros and ones. Okay? So the Qs could be representing just the numbers, occupation number N sub P. But the difference is that the operators that act on a qubit state don't have the same commutation relations. So what we have to do is we have to develop a mapping which will take us, take these operators here, the fermionic annihilation operators, and we need to determine what the correct qubit operator is that corresponds to this. So this is the operator that I talked about before, and I said that using the fermionic commutation rules, you can uh, verify that this is indeed the case, as you have to then jump over the AP. The AP operator has to jump over all the occupied states here to get to the, the, the state P. If we define our qubit operator in terms of the A's as a string of these operators, so Z is, everyone knows the spin, the Pauli spin operators, right? And, Yep. Right. Right. All right. So this is just Pauli Z on the first entry here, zero. We normally start at zero and go up to P. Uh, and so we go up to P minus one with Zs. And that is nothing other than this string here of minus ones. And this is the, uh, the, Pau the Pauli operator sigma plus, which is the analog. Sorry, this is sigma minus, which is analog of A, A, P. So this is a qubit operator, which will act on qubit states Q to generate the A's. And this operator here, you can verify, obeys the fermionic algebra. So this is, if you like, a qubitization of your fermion, fermionic operator. That's a good, also another exercise to check. So this operator does indeed obey these two, two anti-commutation relations, which is a, the definition of the fermionic algebra. So this is a, then a good and rigorous uh, translation of our fermionic operators to qubit operators, which means that we can now work with these operators on these states here, on the two states. Yeah. Because I've, we've ordered the states here so that, in the, remember I said at the end of the Hartree plot, we've ordered the states so that all the occupied ones are here. And then once we hit a zero, then there's all zero from there on. Okay. Okay, so this mapping, known uh, due to Jordan and Vigna, um, is a two-body fermionic map, it has mapped off two-body fermionic Hamiltonian to a qubit Hamiltonian. 
which has a disadvantage, however, that because we've got this string of z's here. So we're going to so the the string of z's can be quite large and can be up to basically the length. If you have the very last, only the very last state here is occupied, you'll have this will be up to z n minus one. So you basically have a um, uh, delocal, uh, it's, it's a non-local um, Hamiltonian term. It's referred to as order n local. It's local up to terms which could be of weight n. So that's a disadvantage, but that's not so bad. We can actually deal with those, um, and we do deal with those quite effectively, as I'll show you in, uh, in the next slides. Um, there are other mappings that people are, have used, and this the, Fermi, the Jordan Wigner is the simplest one. Uh, there's also a parity mapping, and then there's this uh, Bravier Kitayev mapping, which is quite um, popular. Uh, it's somewhat more complicated to explain. I haven't put it down in detail here, but it has it, it because it, it 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 balances the storage of the occupation and the parity. So the parity is these overall factors of minus one. This factor here essentially tells you about the parity of this state here. Because every time there's a 1, you'll get a factor minus 1. And then depending how many 1s you have, if you have an even number of 1s, then this will, this will give you an overall plus 1. And if you have an odd number of 1s, this will give you an overall minus 1. So that's the parity of that state. And clearly, you could store just that parity rather than all those minus 1s. Yes? Locality of the order of n. So n, uh, an operator that's n local means that it, it will connect at most n, n individual qubits. Okay, so if I have a Hamiltonian that acts only on single qubits, that's one local. If I have a Hamiltonian that acts on two qubits, they could be very far away, but in computer science we call that a two local Hamiltonian. Okay, so it operates on pairs of particles. In physics, you would say that's a two-body part Hamiltonian. But now here, okay, so the main from, from a physics perspective, these Pauli strings are a bit of a nuisance. People say that well, they introduce these n-body interactions. We say this n-local in quantum computation. Okay, so so as I was saying, you could just store the overall parity. That's less information, and I mean it's equal. It's equal overall information, but you don't have to have as much um, storage there. So that gives you a more compact representation. Uh, and these these Hamiltonians become then log n local. But in general, though, the operators do have. Like if you look at a specific instance, the operators have larger weights more qubits. They might be lower locality, but they will involve more of them. Yes? For a quantum computer, what is better from the two of this? Like for a quantum computer, like if you, the, the other one you have... It depends, uh, what uh, your, it depends what your restriction on your resources are. If you don't have a lot of space, a lot of qubits, then this is probably better. If you don't have any restriction on the number of qubits and you want to be... Um, you want to have very small weight operators, then the other one's better. Okay, thank you. But right now, in the current near-term situation, it doesn't really matter which one you use. So some of the results I'll show you um, are done with actually in practice with Bravia Kitaya, because it has a more compact representation. But if you're talking about eight qubits, four qubits, it really doesn't matter. In this case, is there an implied or an explicit classical lookup table that is being relied upon for those betas? Uh, yes. Yeah, there's a construction. I didn't, yeah. I didn't give it because it's quite complicated to explain. But there is a construction. Yes, it's very explicit. Yes. Yes. Uh, does this mean that to create a qubit, I uh, wanted to change the state of the qubit and add electrons to the system? No. To change the state of the qubit? Yeah. Or are you just moving electrons between the orbitals? In the first instance, we would just be moving them between. Okay. Yes, it depends what you're doing. It depends what your Hamiltonian is. Your electronic Hamiltonian conserves electrons, so 
we would be. But if you were doing something in quantum in cosmology or quantum gauge theory, you might be creating them. If you're simulating a quantum field theory. Okay, so here's again just a summary then of Bravia Kitaev, and then just a note that there are others. So there's a lot of these. Uh, one of the articles that I put on the um, for extra reading, McCardle has a little table of at least two of those. I think it maybe even discuss the parity and the Bravia Kitaev and this one and the fermion, Jordan fermion. But for the, to, to start out, the Jordan fermion, Jordan Wigner is the simplest one to, to understand, less, the least involved in terms of generation. Okay, this is a table from, let's see if I can make this bigger. This is a table from Whitfield. It's one of the articles I put on the, um, in the additional materials for the course, and you see here that this table shows you the, for several operators, so the electronic structure operators, the, the number operator here, which just counts the number of electrons in a particular orbital, that's A dagger P, A P. That translates in Pauli representation to just one minus a sigma Z, so that's the simplest operator. Uh, and that, because it's one minus sigma Z, that's just going to give rise to a phase. But then we have the, um, this is a single particle, so these are basic operators A dagger P, A Q, these are the kinetic energy operators, and these are somewhat more complicated here. So they involve products of sigma X Q, sigma X P, and then, a sigma, and then this string of Pauli, this is a string of Pauli Z's in the front. Uh, the Coulomb operators are here, they are not so bad, and then we start to get to the, um, excitation operators, double excitation operators, number excitation operators, and they become quite messy. So but there is a wonderful software package, Open Fermion, that is quite mature at this point, and everything like this is nowadays under the hood. You don't really need to work it through yourselves in detail. Then I also put this one here. This is from the same paper. Um, these are circuits. This is going now beyond uh, ahead from the operators to have circuits. These circuits generate the exponential of these operators. Okay? In particular, they generate uh, the imaginary uh, e, to the minus, e to the i operator t over h bar for doing time evolution. Which is, but in general, exponential exponentiation of these operators. Uh, I have a slide on that later. It's used in multiple situations in quantum computation for quantum chemistry. So these are circuit primitives that show up everywhere. And you, again, let me just point out the simplest one: the, the number operator, which is a dagger p a p, which just has translated to that operation uh, sigma z. When we exponentiate that exponential of sigma z, you'll just get a phase, which is represented here by t, a phase by some angle theta, a phase, a phase um, a rotation around z. And these others have more complex uh, representation in terms of circuits. Yeah. Sorry, I need to go down now. Right. So maybe I can make this one bigger too. Okay, so now we start to think about um, implementing uh, calculations with these, uh, with these states and these operators. So this is just before we get to algorithms, I just wanted to point out what's uh, a concern, uh, what, what kind of things are concerns nowadays for in these near-term devices. So, of course, one is very, very concerned about the number of physical qubits. It can't be too large right now. Uh, the connectivity between qubits is important. So this is an example of uh, a circuit with two steps where the, the second one, two circuit steps. So this is step one, and this step two could be done in, um, 
in two different ways, depending on what connectivity you have between them. So if you had only nearest neighbor connections, you would have this version here. But if you could get, I'm going to say which one's the nearest, oh, sorry, this, so this one, the, the nearest neighbor connections is this on the right, where you have to then have this. Uh, so if you wanted to do a, so an SU4 is a two qubit gate operation. And in step two, you want to do an SU4 operation between qubits two and three, which is fine. They would, and you also want to do an SU4 operation between qubits one and four. So if you had nearest neighbor connectivity only, these nine qubits were in a line, then you could easily do Q2 and Q3, because they're next to each other. You might have a problem doing Q1 and Q, a gate between Q1 and Q4, because they are separated by longer distance, and also you've got these other qubits in the way. So if you had to do that, you would, uh, with this restriction to nearest neighbor uh, connectivity, you would take this implementation here, where you would do SU, the Q2, Q3 qubit here first, that's fine, no problem. But you would then have to swap in, you'd have to have these two swap gates, which would transform, transfer the state information from qubit four and qubit one onto the states Q and three. And you would then, then do that second SU4 operation between states qubit uh, two and three, which are now representing states of qubit one and qubit four. And you have to keep track of all of this is going along. So that's a lot more work. And on many computer architectures today, the swap gate is actually rather expensive. It has to be decomposed into other uh, primitive gates, like C0 and single qubit rotations. So this is a, a disadvantage if you have to do this. So connectivity is important today, uh, certainly today. Um, then, because it will, it can, if you have low connectivity, it will increase your gate count. Then you also have to be concerned about your errors rates and the intrinsic lifetime of your qubits, um, which all, both of which restrict the number of gates that can be applied before errors will just cause everything to be um, uh, meaningless. So masking the result is a nice way of saying you don't have any good results. Um, and Yes, and then, of course, if you talk to your experimental colleagues, well, they'll tell you, I can do this gate, but not that one. So please come back and give me another one. Um, and then you also want to optimize the number of operations that can be run in parallel. I mean, that's the same as compilation in general. OK, so there's this metric that has uh, been developed over the years to, um, to sort of to measure how good the hardware is today. It's called the quantum volume. And it's developed by uh, this group, um, I think in Germany, some time ago. And so it's basically, uh, roughly speaking, the, let me see, do I have, ah, yes, I had it on the bottom of the slide. It's roughly speaking the, um, the largest uh, square that you could where if you take the number of gates in one dimension and the number of um, and the number of physical qubits in the other dimension, and your ideal case would be that you'd have the same number of gates and the same number of qubits. Um, how how good do, can you get? Uh, and so one takes it basically as the minimum of the um, the minimum of the number of qubits and the number of this is the number of gates with a particular error rate if, uh, epsilon per gate. And you square this, and then you find the minimum of that, but you maximize over all little n. So it's rather, at this point, it's a rather complicated definition. But um, we want this, quant the, the, the major point is that we want this quantity to be large, and the connectivity is playing a role here. So just to see where this definition, what numbers you get that nowadays. So there's a newer definition from IBM, which takes the log to the base two of this. Um, and they have, uh, I think the current record is actually held by Quantinuum, which is a trapped ion uh, platform. And they have a quantum volume, uh, which is two to the 19. I guess the log of that would be 90. 
uh, which is a record set in 2023 with 20 qubits. Okay, so that means they can do a lot of gates. Uh, I mean, so if you take this number, the square number, but you then say, take 20 qubits, that means that they can do well, well above 1,000 gates. Okay, so now I'm going to move to algorithms for quantum chemistry. Any questions on the points so far? The, the circuit depth is the 1 over n EF. I don't remember, like, the quantum volume is a minimum between the number of qubits and the uh, depth of the circuit? No, the quantum volume is a number. This, so it's represented here by the color scale. Right. Oh. Right. Because it's, it's, a, it's a function of two dimensions. The number of qubits uh, and the, the effective error rate. So the, number, so the effective error rate here trans, can be translated into the number of gates, essentially that you could do on this number of qubits. Yeah, yeah, so it's a, bit, it's a bit involved. You have to sort of look at it a bit, yeah. But essentially, in this plot, they are showing the effective error rate, so this epsilon of n and n here. And okay. to your knowledge, they are using actually that machine to actually run? No, this is, a, this is a theoretical calculation. Oh, okay. Yes. But like the continuum right now, they are, they are doing like algorithms for quantum chemistry? Yes. But, so this, if you look on Continuum's website, as I did last night, you'll find this number. Yeah. But they are doing experiments. So these, ex these numbers are typically obtained with random circuits. They're not obtained with algorithms where people are really trying to do something to get a scientific answer. Because they need to sample many different kinds of circuits, and they need to average over different circuits. So they take random circuits. And random circuit sampling is quite mature at this point. OK, so now let's think about, so we have our states, we have our operators, we've shown that we can take this fermionic Hamiltonian and these fermionic states and we can translate uh, them to qubit language. We have uh, well-defined operators uh, to generate these Hartree-Fox states and we have um, well-defined operators representing the uh, the, the, the kinetic and potential terms which show up in the electronic structure Hamiltonian. And I also showed that we can exponentiate those operators and even and make circuits from that. So the, what can we do with that to obtain energies? So there's a very famous uh, quantum algorithm, um, quantum phase estimation, which is one of the keystone algorithms that was built in the late 90s that relies on the properties of a quantum Fourier transform. And this is originally due to Kataev, but then there's variance. I mean, the, the application to finding energies was done by Seth Lloyd and Abrams at MIT. And they, they pointed out that if you have access to a unitary with an eigenvector psi, which satisfies this kind of relationship, in other words, that there's a phase, the, eigenvalu the eigenvalue is basically contained in a phase, here, then there's a circuit that will allow you to determine this phase up to an error epsilon with order 1 over epsilon uses of the unitary u. Okay, so if we want to find an energy eigenvalue or an energy, if we have an eigenvalue, we know that we can get the energy by operating with e to the minus uh, e to the h or ih, if you like, on the state. So this is perfect for getting uh, eigenvalues, energy eigenvalues, if we know, provided we know how to exponentiate our Hamiltonian operators. So this circuit, what this circuit does is uh, your state is input down here. These are all ancillary qubits. They are put into superposition by these Hadamard gates here. Okay. And then one has a series of controlled unitary operations. So these controlled unitary operations, when the, this control qubit is in the one, then this will op the, um, the unitary u to the power 2 to the 0, which is uh, 1. So the, in this first case, when this one's in 1, the unitary u will be implemented on our input state psi. So that state, this uh, register here, will gain the 
um, the phase phi. Then we go to the next one, and then this one will operate twice with u, and then so on until we operate with 2 to the n minus 1 times with u. And then the phases, so if you go through the math of this, you see that the phases that you get on, so remember this is, a, this is going to be a product state of all these ancillas with this psi. The phases that you put on this state here will actually be so-called kicked back to these states here, phase kicked back, and you will then have the phases on all of these qubits, and then you do an inverse Fourier transform of these qubits to extract the uh, binary representation of phi. And what you're doing here with these, these unitaries are becoming successively smaller and smaller. We'll give you smaller and smaller angles because you're doing repeated values of phi. And so you're basically generating bits, smaller and smaller bits, representing the, the, different, uh, the different bits entering to phi. So, psi is like the ground state wave function that we've solved. We would like psi to be the ground state. Yeah, it could be. It could, any wave it's function. any target. It's any target energy state. Right. Okay. In the first instance, people are always looking at the ground state. Ground state, right? Uh, and so then, the we can use this algorithm to get the corresponding energy. Of yes. That. Yes. Two, up to an error epsilon. Yeah. Yes. Uh, provided that we can. So we specify the error we want. And then we have to be using, at most, we might be lucky, we can use less, but we have to use, at big O means at most, 1 over epsilon uses of the unitary. Okay. Because that's why, yeah, so the error epsilon basically, if, you, if phi has something like 10 digits, 10 in binary representation, 10 binary digits, then you want to go up, you want to specify up to the last two digits, you'll have to have at least eight repetitions of U. Okay, this was actually um, shown theoretically, implemented theoretically for um, quantum chemistry by my colleague uh, Andrew, uh, Alanis Buruguzic, who was a graduate student at Berkeley with my other colleague, Martin Hegorn, uh, back in 2005. This is back in the, before most of you were born, <laughs> probably. <laughs> early days. So they showed that this could be used to get electronic energies of molecules. They had a very nice um, way of simplifying this so that they actually only used, I believe, four qubits. So they would be recursively, once they'd got a certain number of qubits, uh, phase qubits out, they would then store those, take them off, and then use the same four qubits to do again and again. So they didn't actually have to use a very large number of qubits. But they showed this was possible to do, and they did actually real calculation for water using eight qubits and extracted the uh, energy, basically. So the V here, so this unitary, was basically the time evolution operator. So those were the circuits that I showed you before um, from the Whitfield article. Okay, those operators that go into this. And then, of course, if this is an eigenstate, that would translate to um, the, the phase being equal to the energy. Okay, so let's think about what the, re the restriction here. So I said that there you have to, this is the same circuit, um, and here just re writing E as H. Uh, the, I said you have to have an order one over epsilon repetitions of U. That's true, but there's one more constraint, uh, which is very important. That the result is a probabilistic result. So you have to repeat the circuit many, many times, even if you have a given number of repetitions of U. And you will get then the right energy with a probability given by, essentially determined by the overlap of the state that you've put in over here, which is your trial state, the overlap with a true energy. So if you put any arbitrary state in here, you're probably going to get a very bad result. You have to have some idea where the, what the energy really is, and, and hopefully that's enough, but better you have some idea what the state actually looks like. And more recent work has shown that the, the actual overhead that you need 
goes not only as 1 over n at most, but it's going to be of the order of some polynomial of the log of the overlap. Okay, so this overlap factor is very important. You need a good starting state. So because this, so the other thing about this is because you had to have these controlled unitaries. And now let me say what people have done. Um, so, so my colleagues did, you know, they, this was on a, a theoretical calculation back in 2005. And then the first kinds of experimental calculations with that, uh, simulations of this were done in about 2013, 14, I think. And they, they just got noise. It was terrible. Uh, um, and so very quickly, um, the Harvard group thought about, well, what can we do to actually work with these noisy machines? So they came up with this notion of a variational quantum eigensolver. And they said, well, rather than do this exponentiation of these operators and, um, and have to do these controlled unitaries uh, multiple times to get accurate ones, why don't we just prepare um, a state, which we think is something good, Know, with some, some parameterized circuit. So, and then we will just then evaluate. So we'll prepare this state, and then we'll just go and make measurements to evaluate the expectation value of these Hamiltonian operators between these states. And we'll use the variational principle, which is sort of a cornerstone of the uh, quantum chemistry. Uh, we'll use the variational principle, provided our, um, this ANSAT state here is satisfying appropriate boundary conditions and so on, then we will get an upper bound to the energy that we're seeking. So this, uh, I think the first experiment with this was done in 2014, and it's really taken off since then. It's very, very widely used. This is, uh, again, from this article by Moll, which is in your materials, a uh, summary of how it works. So you, you take um, the fermionic problem, you translate to the qubit Hamiltonian, so, and yeah, so the whole Kubit Hamiltonian is always written in terms of basically strings of Paulis. That was that big table I showed you. There were strings of uh, multi qubit Paulis. And the idea is that you would prepare a trial state, which depends upon some parameters in those single qubit Paulis. You know, some of them would be single qubit rotations, um, some of them would may, maybe be uh, two qubit gates with a, a continuous parameter in it, but it's typically it's the single qubit gates which have the parameters, continuous parameters. And you would prepare a trial state with the given set of parameters in your circuit, in your gates, and then you measure the expectation values of each of the terms in this Hamiltonian. So each of those terms is of this form. It's a product of a string of Paulis with some coefficients in front, and you measure the expectation value of that string of Paulis between your trial state. Then you take that, you go to a classical, this is quantum, you go to a classical computer, you input all of these uh, expectation values to, and you sum them all together with their coefficients h, little h, sub a. Okay, that gives you an estimate for the energy. And this energy should be greater than or equal to the exact energy. So you then do an optimization where you say, I'm going to then well, that's my cost function. I want to minimize this cost function. I will then calculate the derivatives of this energy with respect to each of those parameters theta in the circuit. And then I will adjust those parameters in the right direction. I use a gradient descent or something. I'll adjust them in the right direction. And then I'll go around again. I'll go back, prepare the trial state, measure the expectation values, put the energy, reassemble the energy, check the value, and then calculate the next derivative, which direction to go in, and adjust the parameters. So I'd, eventually, you'd get a solution. Theta star, which ideally would be the minimal, corresponding to the minimal energy. So this sounded wonderful, but it had a lot of problems. And so first of all, I'm just putting here the, um, what's actually the overhead. So the overhead now has shifted away from, away from having long circuits with lots of controlled unitaries to having short circuits. The idea is to make these states psi of theta, which are, correspond to short depth circuits that can be made on near-term machines. But now I have to make many, many more measurements. And I have to run it 
many, many, many more times because I have to now do an, an optimi this classical variational optimization loop. Okay, so it's a lot more intensive in, re in the uh, measurement resources, and the measurement resources are tr tricky. So here, um, there's an estimate of this. So if I have capital M terms in the Hamiltonian and parameterized gates, total number G, little n qubits, capital N spin orbitals, so you need to estimate each term in the Hamiltonian for each parameterized gate. And you do that by direct sampling with error E on the energy. So direct sampling means that I have to repeat the circuit many times to pull out for each, any one of those expectation values. So each time I pull it out, each time I run the circuit and pull out an estimate for the expectation value of one of those Pauli operators, I've now made a classical measurement, I've got classical information, I send it on to my machine, but I have to, that's only one point, and as you remember from quantum mechanics, one measurement has no information. You need to make many, many measurements to get actually some estimate of the actual coefficients of the wave function in the, in the wave function that you have. Um, so we need to sample, to sample each term to with an error epsilon. We need of order one over epsilon squared measurement shots because this is basically a classical estimation problem. Um, and so then we have to repeat this also for each parameterized gate. So that means we're going to have at most order g times m squared measurement, m squared over epsilon squared because we, uh, okay, so then another factor of m comes in here. Uh, I've missed that one out there. There's, an, there's, a each, uh, there's another factor of m that comes in here because you're um, measuring the, uh, you're doing it for m gates, no, m terms in the Hamiltonian, and sampling the term, it's to error, it's epsilon over root m. So, so you get this total here, but now you have, on, on an average, you'll have at most, an upper bound of n to the four terms in the Hamiltonian, and g can have also up to n squared terms. Now these are sort of maximum amounts, and you can partition them together. Both of these things can be partitioned together so that you can measure all the, in one shot of your run, run of your circuit that you can measure a set of terms together because they use the same basis. They'll be measuring the same basis up to a single Pauli rotation. And so you can reduce this to something of the order um, of the upper bounded by n to the 4 over epsilon squared. And if you do then further smart factorization techniques on the Hamiltonian, you can reduce this down to order n over epsilon squared. Um, so there's a lot of work over the last five years has gone into this work here. But then you still, so you still have to repeat this many times for the optimization of all circuit parameters. So this becomes enormous. And notice that this scaling here is 1 over epsilon squared. And epsilon is the precision, so it's a small number. It's way, way below 1. And this is worse than the quantum phase estimation. So the, measure, so the um, variational quantum algorithm eigensolver is always advertised as a good alternative to quantum phase estimation, and overall it is, but it's intrinsic. If you want to get really, really accurate answers, intrinsically the scaling here is very bad, because it goes with 1 over epsilon squared rather than 1 over epsilon. And this is uh, an issue, it has become a real issue, and to that I didn't add this here, but there is this aspect of barren plateau that some of you may have heard of, that this is a multi-dimensional optimization, and it can get not only trapped into local minima, but it actually can reach regions where the surface is, the landscape is very, very flat. So you don't really know where you're going, and you can spend a lot of time if you get stuck on these flat surfaces. You know, you really want to find the cliff where you go off, but you're stuck on this top of this plateau. So, so there's a lot of issues with this um, optimization. So this is no panacea either. Um, so for the G scaling, is this um, under assumption that it's going to be heuristic on sets? Because I think for UCC, it might be, the scaling might be more. Yeah, no, this is, this is totally generic. This oh, is okay. wor actually, this is worst case. Yes. Okay. It's generic. It's without any. So we'll come to UCC. Okay. Okay, so I think what I've 
It's only for QPE, and I said the initial state preparation is essential. The VQE is also very important. Yeah, so another question. Yeah, I think I have a simple question, which is can you tell me some intuition on how this variational quantum eigen solver is doing better than the classical variational eigen solver? I would say today it's not doing, class, not doing any better at all. It's only been applied to very small systems, and the noise in the current quantum devices is just too large to allow it to be really accurate. I'll show you some results shortly, but you'll see no one's done really very large systems. So if, so if you're asking about can it do better in terms of quantum advantage, I think there's no evidence for that right now. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the initial state preparation. Okay, so I mentioned that the, for quantum phase estimation, the computational expense increases as the overlap of the initial state with the solution decreases. So that means you really have to then work hard with your initial state. And I'll talk more about this in the second lecture, actually. In VQE, the computational expense increases if you have to do many optimization cycles above and beyond what I summarized on the previous slide. So you want to then have also um, an accurate ANSAT state. But in VQ, you, you want to have not only an accurate ANSAT state, you want to have an ANSAT state that's easy to prepare. And those are often incompatible desiderata. You'd like to have low depth quantum circuits, because that was the whole point of using the, v, the variational approach. Um, in other words, so it really does require some polynomial scaling in the number of parameters to be efficiently implemented. So that means relatively simple circuits. And then the question that interests us, uh, Berkeley, is, well, so can you do something with, for this with strongly correlated electronic systems, which are a, sort of a challenge for classical quantum chemistry? So this is a summary of the kind of ansatz that have been used or proposed to be used today. So people did start with using Hartree-Fock, but that's too simple. We know that that's not going to give us anything uh, of interest to the quantum chemistry community. Um, I'll show you some results from a device for hardware efficient ANSATS that was proposed fairly early on as an alternative to this very beautiful unitary coupled cluster approach, which is something which came out of the quantum chemistry community and is something which is really very well motivated. Because in qu quantum chemistry, there's a a, a, one, a very well-known approach to, uh, to imp incorporate correlations beyond Hartree-Fock is to use a, 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 an excitation operator of the form e to the t, where you put precisely in, you put in, you exponentiated forms of these single, double, and triple excitation operators to build in uh, correlations. So this is a very well-known and very well-researched technique in classical quantum chemistry. But it is not variational in its in the simple form, and it's also not unitary. Uh, but in quantum mechanic, in a, on a quantum computer, one can easily make it unitary by constructing this operator, which is e to the t minus t adjoint, and then it is unitary. And this is the perfect thing to implement on a quantum computer. So a lot of work has been done with unitary couple cluster and that's it. Um, but they're nearly always used with a single Hartree-Fock uh, reference state. In other words, this state phi would be one Hartree-Fock state. And as I'll show you in the second talk, there's um, there was a study done last, just last year that indicated, well, there doesn't really seem to be any, it comes to your question, there doesn't really seem to be any advantage in using um, a quantum computer if, if one has a, um, a single reference uh, on that state. Because they show, well, it'll be the second talk. I'll come to that a little, a little bit more formally. Um, on the other hand, if you have a multi reference state, uh, we've done work that shows you can get a quantum advantage. That will also be in the second state, second talk. And um, so there's, there's quite a lot of interest here in different kinds of ansatz. Um, and then there's also adiabatic state preparation, which, ah, so I've got a few more slides here. Let me see. Maybe unitary. So I guess I have unitary hardware. Yep, I have. Yeah, that's I think the. Yes. Okay. So let me go. Okay. So here. So let me explain some of these ansatz. Then this is the unitary couple cluster. So as I said just now, most work uses a single reference. So one 
Hartree Fock determinant here, which is just one bit string on the uh, quantum computer of this form. And these operators T's are, uh, so these theta would represent the parameters in these operators, which would be, um, so the T operator is a sum over uh, one, two, and higher order excitations. And the parameters would be these terms that go in the front, okay, the amplitudes of each of these excitation operators. Okay. And so, for example, so this is actually from, ah, this is from the, uh, this paper here. So I put the references so you can check the papers. Um, this is a simple example for H2 with the jordan wigner transformation. It is a four qubit uh, calculation. This is all in the minimal basis set for H2. And so you see what, uh, what's happening here is in the first, let me just blow this up a little bit. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the first state here, A, is the vacuum. So that's zero, 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 zero. Then there's Hadamard's on the first qubit or the zeroth qubit, and there's qubit two, qubit zero, qubit two. Sorry, these are X, sorry, they're not Hadamard's. These are um, X gates. So the zero is switched to one here. So then the state out here will be one, zero, one, zero. So that's here. So this is a hartree fox state in the minimal basis here. And then this last one, this circuit here, will create a, this, the result of making this excitation operator y0, x1, x2, x3. So this is a four-bit excitation operator acting on this hartree fox state, which will generate these two states here. Okay. Yes. I have a question about uh, the uh, the uh, previous slide. Uh, there's a graph about a uh, quantum volume as a benchmark. So I'm wondering, like, is there like some better benchmark than the that like saying something has a quantum volume? Because doesn't that depend on the uh, specific problem and the hardware that you're working with? Oh, okay. The, the the idea of the quantum volume was to produce something that was generic. That wasn't re that wasn't specific to a particular algorithm. Right. That was generic to say how well the hardware is doing, and it was really an attempt to see to to balance the competing features of you want to have large numbers of qubits and you want to have large numbers of gates, and the large number of qubits means that your coherence time for the entire machine is somewhat restricted, so it will restrict the large number of gates. So they wanted to find some way of describing a metric that would describe the trade-off between these two features uh, in the best possible way to give some idea of what you could actually do if you had either large numbers of qubits and short coherence time or, or, or small numbers of qubits and large number of co large coherence time. So those are like two re endpoint references, but somewhere in between might be a better place to operate. And that's why they developed this metric. So it was, and that's why, another reason why they use random quantum circuits because it they didn't want to be tied to a specific algorithm. So now we're moving, so things have changed a lot, are changing a lot very rapidly now. Now a lot of people are starting to think about co-design, co-design of hardware with algorithms. Maybe we'll eventually, we will have some special purpose machines. But, but in the beginning, the idea was to show universal quantum computation and to build a comp device that would be able to do anything. And so it should be, it should be sort of benchmarked for any arbitrary calculation. So that was the notion of the quantum volume. That's where it came from. Okay. Doctor, I have yes. No question. So basically T1 is for the operator for the singles and T2 is for the doubles? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, yes. these are two these are two A's and these are four A's. Yeah. Can you generalize that for any Yes, yeah, yeah it's three. Yep, yeah, it is. The expansion here is basically infinite. Oh okay. Yeah. And what can you tell me, like, really easy why why this is better than the ancestors of Hartree Fock? Because so it comes back to what I said earlier on that Hartree Fock, every electron is moving in the mean field, the average field of every other electron. So if an electron is in an orbital, let's suppose, say, spatial correlation, so if another electron is over here or over there, this electron doesn't distinguish between those two positions. But if if you build in these excitations 
then there's the energy of this electron here is affected by whether the other electron is there or there. So you're building in correlations, and you that lowers your overall energy because you're more sensitive to actually what the electrons are really doing. And I suppose that it's really difficult to create like triples and fourths. And so, so, so do they do they have a limit on K? Formally, you should go to infinite order, yeah. or to order of the number of electrons that you have. Yes. But like in practice. But, in practice, they do quadruples, right? That's we, well, C -C CSD, parenthesis D, but, D. but T is uh, treated in perturbative way, so but I'm always using T in like actual way. Yeah, so UCC, oh, sorry, it's in the classical regime, it's just CC. CCSD is very common. It's CCSDT, but it's parenthesis T, meaning it's perturbative. And I've seen CCSDTQ. <laughs> In practice, people do CCSD or CCSD with some T. Okay. Okay. Uh, really quick. So, yeah. just in general, Hartree Fox state in the computational basis yes. is just a single bit string. Yes. And then anything of higher order determinants are represented as these like superpositions of bit strings. Yes. Of these yes. Hartree -Fox and, yeah. And how you get those superpositions yes. is. Yeah. Well, that's, this is one way. There's other ways. You could also take, um, I mean, you can take Taylor series expansions of these exponentials. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Depending who you are, what background you have, you might prefer yeah. to do that. Yes. Yeah. And then there was another question about that. Maybe I could show one other. So the ansatz, what I'd like to show is the other ansatz, the hardware efficient ansatz. No, no, I'm, there we go. What is this one? Ah, here. Okay, so this one. Whoops. I need to make. Okay. This is the hardware efficient ansatz that was, I think, first. I'm not sure who was the first to do it, but there's a result from IBM that, a few years ago that used this very effectively, and I'll show you that. Uh, so here, the idea, the thinking was that, well. Those exponentiated operators from UCC, UCC is formally very nice, it's very beautiful, it's, you know, it's the, like the quantum answer to classical CC, which had these problems of not being variational and, um, and very difficult to work with beyond second order. So the problem with it is though you have these exponentiated operators, which are these rather complicated circuits. So what the experimentalists suggested is, well, why don't we just Put, take whatever gates we can make, rather than being restricted to do those particular gates that are required in the uh, UCC ANSAT, we'll take whatever entangling two qubit gates we can make, and whatever single qubit gates we can make, just make sure that it's in a universal set formally, and then we'll just construct layers of single qubit gates, layers of an entangling gate, layers of single qubit gates, layers of entangling gate, and this is an instance where I think, um, well, this is actually a heuristic, but you know, so typically the two qubit gates don't have parameters, so you would just put them down, but you might put them, their locations to be randomly between different qubits here. And the single qubit gates, you would have parameters associated with each of these, or you might have for simplicity, all of these gates at this, at this step here would have the same parameter, the same angle. But, but they could be either a, an X rotation or a Z rotation or a Y rotation. Actually, in this instance, they're labeled with different angles for the X, Y, and Z. Okay? And so then you write down your ansatz as your, uh, your in fact, I think in this case, it doesn't even really have to be the Hartree Fock. You could just start at the, right at the very beginning, the vacuum state, and then just create excitations with a whole string of these parameterized gates. So this would be completely agnostic. This is quantum chemistry agnostic, generation of an ansatz. And um, you do this as many times as you think you need to do, and you see what you get. So that's, Okay, and the last ansatz uh, that sometimes people have used, or certainly theoretically there's been a lot of effort on this, is adiabatic state preparation, which is related to quantum annealing. So if you want to prepare the ground state of some Hamiltonian, 
but there's some easy Hamiltonian that you know the ground state of that you could start with. So you start in that ground state, and then you evolve under some time-dependent Hamiltonian, which takes you smoothly from the initial Hamiltonian. So this one gets switched off as this one gets smoothly switched on over a given time t. And this, this is sort of very well suited to spin Hamiltonians, not so much to electronic structure. OK, then I wanted to point out this. So, OK. Yes. Note in everything that we've talked about so far is that these exponentiated operators show up in different guises. Yeah, I'll just come to that. I just want to summarize this. So we, in quantum phase estimation, we had this evolution um, or this unitary, which was just e to the i, the operator behind the energy. So that was a Hamiltonian operator there. Well, there was no notion necessarily of time evolution there. We just had to have exponential of i h. The UCC ansatzer, they use the ex exponentials of the sum over excitation operators. And then for time evolution, we, we want to apply e to the iht over h bar, or probably e to the minus iht over h bar, we're physicists, to a state. So it's the same kind of circuits that we're using for all of these. So that was a question. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I understand, understood the whole point of the agnostic method. So what, were they, what were they going towards with that method? So, the, OK, let me just. Ah, OK, so this is a good place to, this will be a good place to stop for the break, right? Um, so after the break, I'll show you some examples of experiments that were done with these, this level of theory. Um, so the agnostic one, what, why did they want to do this? Because this was IBM wanted to do this because they had, uh, let me see if I have, I have a slide from IBM. Afterwards, I can actually show you the slide now, specifically. Yeah. This is uh, this was done in 2017 or published in 2017. This was actually a, a calculation for beryllium hydride, which is a non-trivial but small molecule. Um, so what they did here, so they did uh, six qubits, six qubits here. So they had a layer of um, single qubit gates. And then they have their particular version entangling gate. And their particular entangling gate, uh, I, I didn't check what, which one it was, but rather than use a prescribed circuit from um, required by exponentiating, they prefer to just put randomly in here their own favorite easy to perform entangling gate with random connections between the, the qubits here. Notice that these are not nearest neighbor necessarily. And so, and then they would have different, a, multiple, a certain number of layers, D, and they would increase the number of layers until they find they get good results. And so they, their parameters are then the parameters in these single qubit rotations here and the single qubit rotations there. So here they have single qubit rotations. Oh, sorry, here they have single qubit rotations. That's this layer here. This is all inside this box. So this box has an entangler and another layer of single qubits. Here, here, and here. But all of these things are, oh, these ones are constant. These ones are hill fixed. These are pi over twos. These ones are variable, and these ones are variable. OK, so this is just what's easy for them to do. And it's not so hard for them to increase these layers. They went up to 16 layers. OK? And they could do that. And so the idea was that they're just parameterizing with some non-physically motivated ansatz, but they, the hope is that they have enough uh, flexibility in their ansatz that they can build in the correlations which are present in the ground state of this molecule. Uh, but what enables them to do better when they increase D? Uh, they have more flexibility, they have more parameters. They have more parameters. Each, so each layer has one, two, three, four, five, six single qubit gates and the location of these two qubit gates. So they're, getting more, they're putting more parameters in, and provided they can still do the optimization, the optimization problem is getting bigger, um, they would then do better. And this is actually probably a good place to stop, because this result shows very nicely they, 
They uh, do quite well, so let's explain what this is. The dashed line here at the bottom are the exact values. This is a system that's relatively easy to do with quantum chemistry in this basis. It was six qubits, I think. Yeah, six qubits, minimal basis. So that's the exact line. So the, the experimental values were just these one, four points here, the black dots. So they're quite a bit higher, which is good. They're not violating the uh, variational principle. The energies are higher. But they're, they're rather high. They're a lot higher. Um, oh, I forget. I didn't put the energy scale here. Uh, yeah, I don't know what energy scale this is. Can you guess? Is this milli Hartree's? EV. Uh, if it's EV, anyway, it's huge. If it's way beyond, this is way outside the chemical accuracy, uh, which is milli Hartree. So, but the interesting thing I found, most interesting thing that I found about these results is that, one, two, actually there's five, five points here. The most interesting thing is that these black lines agree quite well with calculations that they made simulating the performance of their machine, including the effect of noise on the machine, including the decoherence. So that's including the finite temperature, it's including all the errors. So they have calibrated their machine to running random circuits or whatever they're running, or running just each gate individually. They've calibrated how well, what the fidelity is. They do gate set tomography. They calibrate each gate to find out how well the gate does. And then also they calibrate the performance of the circuit when it runs more than one gate. So they can, from that, they can construct noise models with which to do an open quantum systems calculation to simulate the performance of the machine during a computation. And so when they did that, they get these, these lines. I mean, these are, I guess, their sample, their sample points with some uncertainties. And so their, their noise model agrees quite well with their results. So that's encouraging. Yes? Suppose instead of having an IBM computer that they had a perfect quantum computer with no problems, yes. what's the problem size at which uh, the, their quantum approach would be a classical approach in time? <laughs> so this system, probably never. Oh, this is a very small system. This is very easy to do on a classical computer. So, but maybe for a, a larger problem size, that yes. maybe that, uh, the quantum approach would show its worth. Well, OK, the difficulty is that the VQE is a heuristic approach. And you have this classical optimization step in there. And so, so it, there's a lot of overhead in the VQE. And the, all the repetitions you have to do to get the measurement noise down so that each you have to repeat the circuits many, many times. I mean, for a given set of parameters, you have to repeat the circuit many, many times to get, to get the value of this particular point here, even before you optimize it. And then you're optimizing it to try to bring it down. So that's a huge overhead. That's going to be a lot more than it would take you to do uh, with Gaussian or whatever your favorite quantum chemistry package is to solve the energy for beryllium hydride. And the... And going to larger systems, we just don't have yet machines that we can do larger systems with VQE. And the optimization problem gets larger for VQE. So it's not really clear whether VQE will persist as a long-term uh, algorithmic approach. Yeah. So I think this is a good place to stop. Um, I had a...